I'm very happy to uh, welcome all of you to this special seminar, which, as you know, is organized jointly by SONAE and Porto Business School. The exponential nature of our era, what is that? Well, you will know very soon. But when I read about it, there was a quote from Paul Valéry, a French author that some of you may know. He said something that I think is very pertinent to the topic here. He said, the future is not what it used to be. All right? And listen to the conversation that we'll have tonight, and you will see how insightful that was and how important it is today. Here at Porto Business School, this event follows our tradition of bringing distinguished uh, guest speakers, business leaders, thought leaders, innovators, who share with us their experiences and insights um, and wisdom. Uh, it's a way to inspiring us, energizing us, and make us think, help us reflect our own beliefs, our behaviors, our leadership styles, and our assumptions. As a business school, we want to be, I suppose, all schools want to be different, but we certainly want to be leading edge and, and try to be ahead of the game and try to address issues that confront people and organizations, not only today, but in the future, and try to see how the old techniques and ways of looking at things are no longer valid because, as I said, the future is not what it used to be. And an extrapolation and, and doing business as we did is no longer valid. So it's also about understanding this phenomena and, and try to find new ways, try to find new tools. So that's what our school is about in many ways. And I don't want to spend more time talking about the future of our school, which we could also say, which is not what it used to be, neither. <laughs> so. I, I am only very glad to have Hans van der Loh here, which uh, we've been discovering. We have a few things in common back in the Netherlands and even in France, and uh, even uh, with Shell, because I did some work with Shell at some point. But without any further ado, I'd like to now pass the word to Sonai, who will introduce him properly. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Very well. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's masterclass. Um, as Ramon said, I have the, the privilege uh, of introducing uh, Hans van der Loo uh, to you all. Oops. Um, and it's a complicated task uh, because Hans has, a, has an outstanding CV, uh, a lot of experience, uh, many different things, uh, but I'll try to do it uh, briefly. So uh, Hans has over 30 years of experience uh, in, international, uh, in an international business setting. Um, he has been, among other things, uh, Vice President of Shell, uh, where he has uh, worked in their scenario development uh, uh, process, which is very interesting, particularly to me. Um, he is um, currently a distinguished speaker, uh, expert uh, on systemic risk and societal change and societal um, um, uh, resilience, and a strong advocate, I must say, of uh, de the development of national strategies regarding talent, namely in what regards uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and I think this is, uh, it, it, you can tell it's a big passion of his, and I'm sure he will talk about that uh, as well. And he is an advocate of this uh, because this is, very, this is a very important topic in order to address the future in a more systemic way and to be able to address the skills mismatch, uh, which, which uh, he truly feels that exists currently uh, in our society. And so this is a very interesting topic that I'm, I'm sure he will cover it as well. Um, Hans uh, has been uh, actively involved in advising um, senior uh, policymakers worldwide, um, both at the European Commission, also at NATO, um, uh, but also the president of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, and he is often a guest speaker at uh, international events, uh, conferences, and business schools worldwide. Uh, so without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Hans van der Loo with a warm applause. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, um, for being here.
this by the Dura River and a nice glass of white port or beer or whatever you like sitting outside rather than coming to this beautiful room and listen to somebody. So thank you for being here. This being a business school, I've actually given it a bit the name of a case study. I presume you do that here as well, case studies. I mean, I've been at two, I'm so stupid, I had to go to two business schools. But at both of them, they had case studies. So I presume you do these here as well. And so tonight, I want to talk about the case of your or our future. And you may like it or dislike it. You are part of this. You are into this. And the choice you really have is whether you have an active role or a passive role. But there's no option of not having a role in this future. Now, already the dean referred to the future is no longer what it used to be. Another joke in the same uh, genre, Roman, is from um, actually uh, Harold Macmillan, the British Prime Minister, I think in the late 50s or early 70s, when he said, you know, forecasting is quite difficult, particularly when it uh, concerns the future. Now, I'm not going to talk about forecasting. Uh, um, I am going to talk more about how we can make sense of the changes, because whilst the future is not given, it is also not random. And that means that thinking about ways to understand it systemically and holistically, what are the trends, what are the cycles, what are the drivers that are leading it, is of value, particularly if you are where you are and you want to lead larger organizations. The um, introduction I got, and thank you for that as well, uh, and my passion for notably STEM skills, means that I actually talk more often to teachers or to education policymakers, but sometimes I do speak at, uh, at business schools because of my role also at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. There we do have a special module. How can we influence the thinking of CEOs? And I've seen you a little bit as future CEOs and whether that's of a very large company or a medium company, it doesn't matter. You will all be in roles of leadership. And so the reason why I'm interested in speaking with leaders is that you have relatively more impact than maybe somebody who delivers the mail. However, you have already made your choice. Now, I still would like to contribute to the quality of your education by coming and talk, but mostly I'm trying to leverage the direction where talent is going. So I like to influence the processes that influence young boys and girls in the age range of, say, 9 till 16, what do I want to do later on? Because the problem-solving potential of society, on the one hand, depends on the quality of education, but also, on the other hand, on how many people have their brains trained in STEM skills. Now, STEM stands for science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I'm not saying that you all should become engineers for you too late anyway, because you know you made your choice. It's not necessary. I'm not an engineer either. But I think STEM skills help more than other skills to foster systemic thinking. I have taken my kids to the trenches in Verdun. And I've told them, you know, there were days where at night for dinner, there were 12,000 boys fewer than at breakfast. And I said, but how is that possible? Did they get lost? I said, well, kind of. Were they dead the next day? I said, no, they had no more breakfast, lunches, or dinners ever in their life. They died. If you would go in the soil here, it would be red of blood. 12,000 in one day. And then I talk about Versailles and about the peace treaty after the 1418 war and how the way Versailles was formulated actually set us up for the Second World War. So even in history and in politics, there are systemic connections, but they are less hard, they are softer. So it is easier to interpret them in hindsight. This is what happened because of that than in a predictive mode. It's possible, but it's more difficult. Whereas if I ask you how much is one plus two, and you give me any other answer than three, you get some feedback, right? So it is a more rigid way to train the systemic thinking. So it is more the systemic and holistic thinking than whether you were an engineer or a lawyer or what have you. So the uh, case about um, the future now, let me see how this works. So what I propose to do tonight is um, actually take you through a couple of perspectives. 
because what is very important to appreciate is that, for example, I see this room different from you. I can't see, for example, the slide, but I can see the cameraman out there and I can see the clock. And why is that? Because I'm standing here and you're sitting there. What that means is your perception depends on your perspective. Now, I just took the simple example of where I stand, but that actually is a very true, is a truism, it's very true. So it is very important to have the mental flexibility to look at things from different perspectives. Now that itself, I see some people nodding, well, you are of course intellectual elite. Not everyone is that. But I also know people who are part of intellectual elite who nevertheless don't do it. Now they of course can be blamed because they have the potential and yet don't do it. Those that can't, well, they can't. But it's up to you to actually help society to make the huge transitions that we'll be going through. And this huge transition, that is really the team, theme of my, my, my talk tonight. And I would like to do that. I would like to show you a little film clip. I will begin and I will end with a film clip. Now, let me see whether I got that technology right. So I'll just put it in the start mode first. No, it's not that one. So how do I get out of here now? Try it again. Try it again. Try it there. So maybe move then sideways. I have to go to that one, yes. Okay, so before it starts, so this is a, it lasts 57 seconds, so you have to pay attention. It is actually, it represents the history of our planet as a flight from Los Angeles to New York. And just pay attention, so we take off on the Los Angeles, some interesting happened before we leave California, pay attention to that as well. But in particular, look at when on that trip, the first anaerobic bacteria came on this planet. Now, they played a hugely important role. And also look where on that trip did plants occur first. And of course, flora was here before fauna. And the last thing, do pay attention how long actually the dinosaurs managed to be on this planet. And as the big surprise at the end, you'll see when we appeared. And that is much closer to New York than maybe you think. Halfway, first and Roman. Thank you. 
So, uh, that was the film you saw. So, put differently, if you took the history of the planet as 24 hours, we've been here for the last three seconds. We've been here for 200,000 years. So, people, you know, not like uh, humanoids, but people like us, the Homo sapiens, the ones with the big brain, and very importantly, the opposing thumb talk about it later. The last three seconds have we been here. Um, you may have seen that the dinosaurs actually sort of extinguished 60 million years ago, but they started 240 million years ago. So they've been here for 180 million years on this planet. We've been here for 200,000 years. That's one-fifth of a millennium. They were here 180 millennia. So, so far, for sure, the dinosaurs did a better job than we did in longevity. Of course, they didn't have the kind of impact on the planet that we have. And I'll talk about, both about the impact, the reason why we were capable of doing that impact, and what is so interesting about the new era. Because here, He's, oops, that is going wrong. I thought the middle one was a little light. It apparently isn't. Okay. What you see here in yellow is like basically what, what geologists give names to eras. So you got, for example, the Paleozoic and the uh, Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, right? But actually, if you look at the blue part where the primitive horses came in here, you got like the last dinosaurs. These, this is where it began. You know, the first dinosaurs, they were there. Like the whole pink part, you know, that's why they were there. The smallest slice there is 1.5 million years ago. And that is the period which is called the Holocene. And the Holocene is basically a set of framework conditions that are ideal for our species. I mean, you've all been outside today. Actually, today was a pretty good day for the race, you know that? And I'm not talking about the street race that will happen on the 20th of May in Porto, as I saw in all the posters. I'm not talking about the Formula One race, which actually was won by a boy who only got his driver's license a few months ago, and he won a Grand Prix. I'm not talking about that race. I'm talking about us, the human race. It was a great day for the human race. Gravity was just right. The temperature, pressure, and composition of the air was just right. Just imagine that gravity would be down by 50%. You'd be half floating around here, you know, your PCs would not stay there, you know, things would float around. If I would just put a zero behind the temperature, you would not survive. Today was what? 20 degrees here in Porto? 200 degrees? You've got no chance. The pressure? Well, you know what happens when an explosion happens on a plane at cruising altitude. You've got seconds and then you're gone. We explode because it's too low pressure. I'm a scuba diver. Well, we can go down 30 meters. If you go down 100 meters, you would implode. So it's either explode or implode, you know, so pressure is pretty important. It was perfect today. It was perfect. Gravity was okay. The airy breeze was okay. Now, I don't blame you that you didn't think about that. I only thought about it because I was going to talk about it tonight. But the reason why I mention it to you you are a generation for whom it becomes relevant to think because actually we are now, right now, in the process of very big changes in the framework conditions for our species. And actually scientists who know far better than I do have actually given that a name. And actually that little blue arrow, 71 years ago, they declared a new era has begun, the Holocene is over, 
we now live in the Anthropocene. Now, I've done quickly done a check. I've seen some people who have got about as much gray hair as I have, but I don't think there's anyone in the room here who was born before 1945. Am I right? Okay. Welcome, fellow Anthroposonites. You're all Anthroposonites because you were born and certainly you're living in the Anthropocene. Now, what does that mean? And is it actually okay for someone to actually call a new era? You can't just do that. No, you can't. There are two very precise conditions that you need to fulfill before you can actually say that we are in a new era. The first and most important condition is that the prevailing conditions have not just evolved a little bit, but have changed significantly. And the second criteria is you must be able to date it in such a way with a marker or a milestone that hundreds of years, thousands of years from now, scientists will be able to find the marker. And, well, you see the picture on the right. The marker they chose is the 16th of July, 1945, because what happened there? In Los Alamos, the Americans, for the first time, successfully detonated an atomic bomb. Of course, a few weeks later, they were deployed on Hiroshima and a few days later on Nagasaki, but the 16th of July was the first date that human mankind was able to master the power of the atom. Now, it's not so much that particular invention or that particular event that is important. Oh, forgot to say, every atomic bomb has a fingerprint, just like each of you has got a fingerprint. So if some of one of you picks something up, you know, and it got stolen, then, you know, we can find, but the fingerprint is either you or you or you. Everyone's got a unique fingerprint. Every atomic bomb has a unique isotope. So by finding the isotopes, you go, ah, that was this one or that was that one. So they are actually registered. And because the radioactivity that will last, it gets weaker and weaker, but that has a very long longevity. But forget about the date. Because the new era did not start. That's the marker they chose. If you look back at it in thousands or millions of years, it doesn't matter whether it was 1945 or 1965. What is important is that in the last couple of decades, so not really 71 years ago, but the last couple of decades, say 30, 40 years ago, things have started to develop in such a way that you can actually say the framework conditions are beginning to change significantly and they are accelerating. So where are we now? Or rather, where are you now? Well, this is your life. Your birthday is on there, you see? So here we've got the 16th of July. This, by the way, is a little reference to the film you just saw, just to get things in proportion. So the planet is four and a half billion years old. Let's apply the Japanese system that we don't count in hundreds or thousands, but in ten thousands. That's easy for this particular exercise. So, or hundred thousands. So it's actually, it is 45,000, hundred thousands. 45,000, hundred thousands, that's the length of the planet. We've been around only two units, not 45,000 units, only two units. So that's, that's three seconds of the footer. The last 170 years, we have actually been, since the Industrial Revolution and the invention, not of fire or of the wheel, but of mechanical energy. That started 170 years ago, and the 70 that refers to the duration of the Anthropocene. So your birthday is on there. Uh, we got two, oh, today's on there as well. You see Porto, 16th of May. And the straight red line is actually your life until today. That is your life. The dotted line is the rest of your life. And since I don't know, you know how carefully you are crossing the streets and things like that, but let's hope that many of you will actually make it until the 15th of July, 1945. And what we will celebrate then, because this will be much more known, is actually the first century accomplished of the Anthropocene. So you are the very, very first generation to live in the Anthropocene. Now, that is of interest for a number of reasons, not in the last, that you actually got the first choice on decisions that can be made now. Later generations can also make decisions about these topics, but it will be far more difficult for them to do things because of what I'm going to talk about next, and that is exponentiality. So we are now in the first century of the Anthropocene. Now, before getting there, I, 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 I just want to highlight, I mean, how incredibly, I have no words for it, successful we are as a species. You saw on the flight there, we actually only appeared on a zebra in Manhattan, you know, if you take the whole thing from Los Angeles. But look at the impact. 
Look at the impact we have had on the world. What we've built, what we've constructed, some of it is even visible from space with the naked eye. And this is actually one of the most famous pictures in the world. Some of you may have seen it before, it's called the pale blue dot picture. And as you can see, it was uh, taken by a space probe in 1990. And this picture was taken at 40 astronomical units from Earth. Now for you to know, one astronomical unit is the distance between the Sun, the central planet in our planetary system, and Earth. So that distance, which is huge, is called one astronomical unit. We were actually able to launch a space probe, propel it out of our solar system, keep controlling it when it's 40 times that out of our solar system, still command it from Houston, and after 13 years of flight, we actually told the probe, now turn around and make a selfie. So it turned around and shot this picture. It shot this picture to get this position. Now, in order to, and it was also able to send back this picture to us. So it is absolutely enormous. Now, for those of you who had not spotted the little blue dot, it's actually that little blue dot there, but from a huge, huge distance. Now, are we the rulers of the world? Are we king whatever? On the one hand, yes, because we achieved that we can take a perspective of ourselves from this distance. But on the other hand, we are so minute, so little. I have the privilege of working together, and I think Ramon, you may know him as well, Andre Kuipers, who is a Dutch um, um, astronaut. I've actually met two other astronauts as well. And astronauts are very special people. Because they, of course, have huge authority and credibility, because they have actually been up there, right? All of them, all of them, not only the ones that I've met because I've seen videos of them, they are all extremely impressed about one thing. And it's not the beauty of our planet. They are impressed about that as well. But they are particularly impressed about the brittleness, the breakability, how careful you have to be, how easily we can break it. The size of the atmosphere, which is really the essence of life on this planet, there are plenty of other planets, you know, but that is really the essence. If you would take a very big sphere, like this, like a very big billiard ball, it would be the thickness of the paint. That's the thickness of our atmosphere. So it is extremely brittle. Now we, over the last 200,000 years, and in particular in the last 170, and in particular in the last 40 years, have made a huge impact on that atmosphere. And so the question is, we are now here. I'm going to talk now about exponentiality. I know you as an intellectual lot know what it is. And I'll tell you now, you don't really know what it is. And we've got education. And hey, we're at business school here, right? So basically, we've got these two factors going on. The challenge of exponentiality, how will we deal with that? And the challenge of education, can we actually not only make you understand, but also give you the resolve to act? And I'll tell you that the latter is more difficult than the former. I also worked as a consultant at McKinsey, and I can tell you, developing a strategy. These guys here at Sony, I mean, you just give us any challenge, we'll sit together for a weekend and we'll do it. Now, to implement a strategy is a million times more difficult. What is also a challenge about developing a strategy is first to know where you are. And then, where do you want to go to? Because a strategy is essentially a pathway between where you are and where you want to go to. Now, to find out where you are is incredibly difficult. It sounds easy, but it's very, very difficult. To write a strategy is easy. To get the people on the pathway, again, is quite difficult. Now, I want to introduce Another concept, because here you see the homo habilis, you know, so it's the, it's the one, the homo, well, actually Erasmus, because I use this for an Erasmus uh, presentation, but that's the, actually the original word, well, so sapiens. So Erasmus is an even better form of, uh, uh, of, of human being than the, the sapiens. But what happened to the homo sapiens is something that did not happen to all the others before him, including the dinosaurs, because they lived in a different time. And I don't mean they lived earlier, time was different. They lived in cyclical time. So you had day and night, you had spring, summer, autumn, winter, and every year was the same. For dinosaurs, there was no difference, and that's also why they did not have a calendar, 
there was no difference between five years from now or seven years earlier. There might be some more food or less, depending on precipitation, how much rain there was been, but every year was the same. And actually, that was also true for all the human beings until the Renaissance, say about 14, 1500. We lived in cyclical time. I mean, houses may have been built a bit sturdier, you know, with some technologies, but in essence, it was the same. And it was actually it was an explosion of inventions, innovations, technologies that happened in the Renaissance that at any given time, oh wow, this is much more different from 10 years ago, or 10 years from now, it will be very different. And that was the entrance of linear time. Now the debate is on, are we still in linear time, or have we actually moved to the next kind of time? And I would argue we have. We are now in exponential time. But the problem is, our education systems, and our thinking, and our tradition, and our education, we are still linear thinkers. Well, I can tell you, if you have the ambition to become a CEO, in the future there is no space for linear thinking CEOs. There's simply no space. I can see that already now, it will get more and more clear, and in 10 years time there's simply no space. You simply will not have a job if you are a linear thinker. Because reality is already becoming exponential, and it will increasingly get more so. You all know as intelligent people, you've had elections here in uh, October last year, or uh, so that was also quite a big move, right? You had the more to the extreme left, I think, that was a bit unusual. In all the elections since then, over the last six months, you know, Austria last week, uh, the Germany uh, 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 federal state elections, you know, uh, um, there was extreme right in Poland, in Bratislava, actually in Bratislava was very bad in Slovakia, the Robert Fitzko had a majority government, he had 52% of the votes. There was a by-election, he lost, he's still the biggest one, 38%. And one of my best friends, Vasa Hudak, was the Minister of Economic Affairs. And the Prime Minister said, can I have your keys back from the office? Because he was not a party man, although he's one of the brightest people in the government. He, being a Slovak, very unusual, he studied international relations at Moscow University, and then did an MBA at Harvard. Now, how many people do you have with that kind of combination? Very few. He got his job because I met him in Brussels when he was the chairman of the East-West Institute, and then, you know, that doesn't earn much money, so he went to J.P. Morgan or Mor uh, Goldman Sachs in London and was involved in giving a loan to Slovakia. And that's why we met the Minister of Finance, and he said, Vasil Hudak, and he spoke some Slovak. You're Slovak, yes. What are you doing on that side of the table? You should come here. So a couple of months later, he was Deputy Minister of Finance, that was three years ago, and two years ago, he became Minister of Economic Affairs. He is no longer there. Why? Why? Why are people voting for extreme parties in every election for the last six or nine months? Why? Because we live in a crisis of trust. Because not only corporate leaders are linear thinkers, political leaders are also linear thinkers. So if reality is this, and I said, I will solve this problem. Oh, blimey, I'm out. Okay, I'll solve it again. Oh, blimey, I'm out again. If you keep applying linear solutions to exponential problems, you will always miss your targets. Now, you're allowed to miss your targets once or twice, but not always. If you always miss your targets, you're clearly incompetent for the job. Whether you're prime minister, minister, CEO, senior manager, vice president, whatever, you are incompetent. You keep missing out all the time because you don't understand that reality is exponential and not linear. People actually do not vote in favor of those extreme parties. They vote against the people in the middle. They're desperate. We would wish you to continue, but you can't do the job. And they vote you out of office. In your sector, I can assure you, the pressure that is mounting on senior executive bonuses will only go up and up and up in two weeks' time, albeit the Shell uh, uh, general shareholders meeting, and I suspect that the same thing will happen as what happened at BP, that the shareholders simply say, well, we do not want that. We do not want that. So what's the, uh, the basis of our success? The basis of our success is actually three things. Our species, although we've only been around for 200 years, is for three reasons why we are so incredibly successful. First of all, it's our big brain. 
But there are a few other species that have got big brains, like dolphins who, and whales, who have apparently very sophisticated ways of communicating with each other. But they lack something. They lack speech, because our speech is far more sophisticated than the signals that they can give to one and another. Because we've got speech, I can explain something to you, and my experience becomes your experience. So I have, I'm doubling or extrapolating the experiences, and you can tell it to him so he can share that. And the third reason, so first reason, brain, big brain, speech, the third reason, this. The we are the only one who can oppose one of our digits with all four others. The opposable thumb. Now, why is that important? And by the way, do like this. If you hold your hands like your prayer about in front of your nose, did you realize that you got 25% of your bones, bones right in front of you? Half of our bones sit in our feet and in our hands. So this is an extremely, exquisitely complex thing to drive. If I would be able to say now, uh, the, the solution to 12,532 times 32,523 is, and I would give the right answer. You would be very impressed. I'm taking this up and I'm putting it right there. That is much more difficult. Can you imagine the, what, 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 all the signals I have to give to all my muscles, not over there? It's far more complex, but we take it for granted. And just a simple sum, two numbers, a computer just checked like that, you know. We, this is extremely sophisticated. And why is it of relevance for our success and learning? Because I can explain something to you because we live in the same era. But I can also write it down. And that means that people that are not alive today can learn as well. So not only can we learn from each other, we can learn from all the ones that were before us. So we are actually a huge accumulator of knowledge. That is why we are so successful. We are the exponential extrapolators by excellence of knowledge. So that is interesting. So how will we then be able to deal with the complex issue of exponentiality? Now, let me ask you a question. Can you please for yourself, I don't know how much you traveled in your life, but the biggest sports stadium you've ever been to in your life? Well, you may have a big one in, in the United States, you may have one in Latin America, if you've been to China, the biggest one you've ever had. I don't know what you have in your mind, 140,000 seats, 180,000, huge stadium. Now imagine the following. All of you are seated on the last row of that stadium that you have got in your mind, on the last row. And you're tight with your wrists on these bars that they have, you know, to avoid that hooligans run up and down. And also your ankles are also tight, you know, to bars or your chairs. And I'm a, very, I'm a sailor, so I can, I, I'm very good at making knots. And of course, how will you have to release the first knot? What will you use to... Sorry? Yeah, your teeth. Yeah, yeah. Go like that. So the first one will take quite a while. Then the second one, you only have one hand available, right? That is a mighty, mighty opposable thumb thing. Huh? There's an instrument of instruments. So you'll be quite good, but you only got one. Now, once you've got them both released, then of course you can use both of them for both your feet. Okay, that's the situation from your side. Now, what I'm going to do, I am going to fill the stadium with water. And the only thing I'm going to tell you is the pattern with which I'm going to fill it. And then there will be the question, so you can start thinking about it already. How many minutes do you have to release yourself or to drown? So, here comes the clue. The pattern with which I will fill the stadium is one drop in the first minute, two drops, four drops, eight drops, 16, 32, 64, 128. So every minute, I will double the amount of water that I put in the first minute, the previous minute. So you, you got the situation? Is everyone clear about the situation? Yeah? So this is about the case of your future. This is about the case of the, of, the, of, the, of the stadium. So how long do you have to undo those four knots or drown? You know, if we go on long enough, at one stage, the water will reach your lips. Now, a little clue. This doubling is an exponential development. So you think and you tell me when you got some bits. 40 seconds. Now, I said that in the first minute, I put in one drop. And then I wait a minute, and then I come back and then I do two drops. So that's after two minutes, there are three drops. So after 40 seconds, there's only one drop. Oh, so 40 minutes, you said. For, so my, my apologies. Okay, I've got one bit, 40 minutes. 
That's pretty quick, huh? Sorry? Did I hear? I want to have a few bits, huh? so I'm just going to wait until I got at least two more. Don't be ashamed. It's no punishment. It's no prize either, other than insight. Insight is the prize, but you all get it, whether you win or lose. So how long does that take? Could it be a day? Or a week? In Ireland, believe it or not, there was an intelligent audience. There was one person. I've never had this before. That person said it would be a year. And I told the gentleman that way before that, all the water of the world would be in that stadium. So that is clearly not within the range. But so do you all agree? Is it for, is it, well, okay, who is for more and who is for less? More. So more. How much more? One hour more? Just 10 minutes more? Or why are we talking? So half, half, okay, good. Half a day, 40 minutes. So we're now between an hour and half a day. Any more bits? Anyone? Let's put it. Anyone more than half a day? Is that the highest bit of this audience? Anyone less than 40 minutes? Less than 40 minutes. How much, how much less? 30 minutes? 30 minutes. Okay, well, still quite close, but it's marginal change. Okay, good. Okay, so there we go, the range. Well, actually, you are the one who was courageous to say it first. You're actually quite close to the truth. The truth is 56 minutes. Now you're like, ah, oh, 56 minutes, but how do you know? Because you don't know how big my stadium is. Well, it's very simple. If your stadium is bigger than what I thought, then it's 57 minutes. Because the 57th minute will put in everything that wasn't there already twice. So no matter how big you stay, once we are there, I got you. So now, this is difficult. I admit, so apologies for teasing you. I know we're time. So now I get an, an easy question, an easy question. So the easy question is as follows. So it, let's agree it's on 56 minutes. Now, how many minutes before the water reaches your lips, how many minutes before that, is the stadium still 97% empty? So at 56 minutes, it's full, it's at your lips. So how many minutes before that is the stadium still 97% empty? So the water might be like here. How many minutes before that? What I hear? 10 minutes, one minute? One minute? Less than one minute. Can't be less than one minute. Yeah. So at 54 minutes, so 56, so four, four minutes, you're saying four minutes? That is very good. It's actually 53, but okay, let's not debate about that because the way you, you reverse it is 97% empty means 3% full. So if it's 3% full now, then the next minute will be 6% full, 12, 24, 48, got you. So five minutes before it reaches your lips, five minutes before, it's still 97% empty. So the first 51 minutes, you think, gosh, this, this is, this, I'm going to sit down. I mean, this is, this is just not going to get anywhere. You know, one, and I have to wait for another minute, and it's two, and then it's four, and I'm kind of very sleepy, and maybe kind of WhatsApp, you know, or do Facebook, you know? And you think it goes on like that, you know? So I'm now 51 minutes in there. <gasps> it's getting really boring, this stuff. So, oh gosh, only 3%. And once you're at 3%, then you get into the critical mass of exponentiality, and then it goes whoop. Now, you all understand this intellectually, don't you? Particularly an audience like this. And yet, there is a gentleman by the name of um, Alfred Bartlett who said, the greatest weakness of human mankind is its inability to understand the exponential function. We don't really understand this. We understand it perhaps intellectually, a particular audience like you, but we do not really know what it means because we are linear thinkers. Look around us. I mean, one person, another person, another a chair, another chair, uh, uh, a computer, another computer, yesterday, today, tomorrow, everything what we observe seems to be linear. Now, if you take a meta perspective or mega perspective or a micro, even in our own body, you know what cancer is. Cancer is nothing else as cell division gone wrong in an exponential way. So it happens at a micro level, it happens at a macro level, it's just at this hour level that there is not very much around us that we can perceive to be exponential. Everything we see around us is linear, so what's the problem? Well, that is the problem because our framework conditions are now changing in an exponential way. Now, 
actually, I will not deliver this. Sometimes, as an audience, I do, I do the trick with the, with the chessboard. You know, it's actually the same story. So it's doubling. I said, look, there's a very intelligent audience. So here we are, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. I think with the audience like this, we actually get to there, you know, just out of our head. So we're not going to do that. I'm going to ask another question. Is there anyone here in the room who thinks that they can pronounce the number that I'm going to show of the number of rice kernels on the last 64th square. I'm not asking what the number is. Nobody knows. I mean, you can calculate it, but I presume nobody knows. But is there anyone who thinks they can pronounce the number when I show it? You're wise men and women. Because it's completely unpronounceable. It is, of course, just very simple. It's 2 to the power of 63. You know, I mean, the first one that is uh, uh, 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, oops, okay, up, 2 to the power of 63, an unpronounceable number. It's huge. What is this? Question to you. Well, this, of course, is what I just showed. I've got 64 squares, it goes in the digits, 64 squares. And here I got my one, two, four, but it goes very flat because I need to show the biggest number. And the biggest number, oh, sorry, I mean, it, it went for this annotation, but that is the number you just showed at the top. This is exponentiality, right? You, you, you agree? You, you, you see it? Yeah? Okay, now question to you. What is this? Clue, start looking at the horizontal bar. Well, got a price here. So now you should be very happy to have such a smart person here. This is in the world population, and this is over the years. And what is this? Sorry, the line is not but you see what I mean, huh? No, this is global GDP in billions of US dollars over time. So it's all exponential. And this is what I just referred to. The greatest shortcoming of the human race is its inability to properly understand the exponential function. So there we are in the enlightened world. Well, this picture, is, is, this a, is this a real picture? Yeah, of course the error. Of course the error is a Portugal. It's Porto, yes, of course, of course, of course. Is this a real picture, by the way? Yeah, yeah of course at night, but is, is, is the picture you could make? Could, can you make this picture? Exactly, not at the same time. It's a real picture, but it's a composite of thousands of pictures, because of course it's never always night and not always without clouds. <laughs> it's night every night, but sometimes you've got cloudy nights, and there's a composition of pictures taken by the satellites around there that on that spot where you see is no cloud and it is dark. So this is the enlightened world, as we know now in 2016. It shows something else. It shows where the light is, obviously. And by the way, this light is actually visible from outer space. But it's interesting where the light is. I don't know whether in Portuguese you also talk about, in English we do, about dark Africa. Well, you can understand why we say that. Africa actually is dark. Because what you see here is light, lumen, but what you also see are dollars, euros, and yen. Because what you see here, what is illuminated, is the wealthy part of the world. There are plenty of people in the dark parts. But when it's night, they sleep. And uh, this is a map. This is not because of your aperitif that you think that something's wrong. This is actually a bit of a strange map. Um, I love these kind of maps because, well, first of all, the maps that we have in our heads, the proper map, and of course, Portuguese have a particular affinity with maps. Uh, you as the great grande navigadores. But the map they had in their mind was more correct than the maps that you have in your mind. Because the map that you have in your mind were made by a Belgian fellow by the name of Mercator. And you cannot correctly reflect a sphere in a two-dimensional flat without smuggling. So the picture that you have in your head of the world actually is wrong, because what he had to do, he had to smuggle. And so it, just imagine that you cut off the football of your son, right? If you do that, the circumference, you leave what it is, but you have to make little indentations at the top and the bottom, and you spread it out and you fill it up. So Russia, Russia is a very, very big country, and so is Canada. But it's not quite as big as we think it is. Whereas countries like Nigeria or Brazil are actually far bigger than we think they are. A good rule of thumb is always, Greenland is the same size as Saudi Arabia. Now look at any map, and it will not be right. But look at the sphere, then you see that's correct. 
So already our perception of the world is wrong because of the maps we walk around in our heads. And that map, what does that reflect? It just reflects the square kilometers and the shape of the country. So this map actually does not reflect the square kilometers or the shape. It actually keeps the countries more or less where they are, but the size of the country reflects the population. Now you can see there's some very big countries that on the previous picture were dark, but there are many people out there. And they all have the aspiration to live like we do. The life that you and I live is lived by about a billion people. And we're now 6.5, 7 billion people. So the other six do not. In actual fact, 1.5 to 2 billion of those people don't even know what electricity is. The only forms of energy they have is animal dung and wood. They don't have gas, let alone electricity. Now, the good thing now is solar energy because they have a lot of sun, so we can bring them energy. But a lot of people are in energy poverty. And then the whole lot in the middle, they have erratic energy. You know, of power plants that fall down. I worked in the Philippines, for example. It was normal that electricity would sort of conk out three or four times a day. So we all had big buffers, energy buffers, batteries uh, under your desk, you know, for the computer. Otherwise, you would, you would lose your, um, your, your work. So when you then come back in Europe, I say, wow, the light actually goes on when I put the switch and it goes off only when I switch it again. That is not normal. If you mean normal to mean the norm that applies for the whole world, that is not normal. It is our normal, but our normal is not the real normal. So the reason why I want to show you this, um, this graph is I said earlier on, you know, the future is unknowable, but it is not random. And it's also true that it is not what it used to be. But what do you think are the most important drivers for the future? If you had to mention a few, what do you think? This is actually a suggestion, hint, hint, hint. Food, water, yeah. Um, but what determines how much food and water we need? No, yeah, climate determines how much water and food we will have. But my question was, what determines how much food and water we need? Not how much we have. The answer to how much we have is climate, but how much we need is demographics. Demographics is the single most important driver of future developments. Because it's not only food and water, but also energy demand and demand for clothing, the demand for mobility, the demand for what, what? It always comes from people have the demand. The second most important driver is economic development. Because you might say, well, this is good news because aren't we kind of flattening off? We're still increasing the population, but the rate of increase is uh, coming down. So we may flatten out halfway this century to about nine or 10 billion. By the way, entre guillemets, we are now about 500 million. And whatever happens with immigrants, we will still be 500 million in 2050. But we will only be 5% of world population, not because any catastrophes will be happening here, but simply because the others grow more. So relatively we become smaller. So Europe should think very carefully, what will we do in the next 30 years to kind of anchor our influence in the terms of values for human rights, for respect for nature. Because, you know, once you get down to the critical mass of 5%, your influence dwindles as well. We will still be a significantly bigger proportion of the global domestic product. And a few years ago, I would have said, well, Europe will never be a political, uh, a military superpower in 2050. I'm actually beginning to change that view now because of developments that are ongoing. We may well choose to do that. And depending on what happens in November, there is already a gentleman there with a rather extreme coiffure who says, well, I'm not going to pay for it. If you want to be defended, you do it yourself. So the world is in huge transformation. But this is still easy compared to the forms of change that I will start talking about now. So anything can happen. That statement is simply not true. Whilst it is not laid out exactly, the future is much more predetermined than many people think. So anything can happen is simply not true. So demographics, economic developments, and innovation. 
Now, the bad thing is that if you look at natural resource demand, ecological stresses that we as a species put on our planet are actually both increasing because of demographic and economic development. The only big lever that we have to compensate for that is by innovation. And that, of course, hopefully our big brain will put us in the capacity to do that. So exponentiality, in a way, if you want to have it in simpler words, is just profound, profound change, whereby both impact and speed are high. I'm not even talking about impact and likelihood, because we don't have to talk about likelihood, because that it is happening is already for sure. What remains is the impact and the speed. And this is perhaps the most important graph I want to share with you in my presentation. Uh, sorry for the small print here, but basically I've copied it up there. So this graph runs from 1750 till 2010. And it's got a number of graphs. You can see there's no vertical axis. And that is because the units all are different units. Because you've got population. That, by the way, is the red line. This is the most important line. Because actually, it is off this line that all the other lines evolve. The other important line, of course, is GDP. Uh, that's the other line that I think is this one. That follows that as well. And we've got lines like water usage, um, uh, uh, the northern hemisphere average surface temperature, the CO2 concentration, motor vehicles. That actually starts out here, you know, in 1900. Actually, I don't know why that's white there, but it's, it's this black line, of course, you know, but it sort of really went up exponential shape there. What I personally find very scary is the species extinction. Because Darwin, Charles Darwin said, diversity is life itself. So life essentially is the diversity because of the interdependencies. I think I forgot the name who said it, but somebody said the human species will die four years after the last bee will have disappeared. Because if there is no pollination, there will be no food. And one of the scariest films that I've ever seen or YouTube films is in China, where you see hundreds of people with little um, shaving uh, equipment actually doing manual pollination. Because bees had died and they keep dying, so they bring in new people or, or groups of bees from the United States and they die again. If we cannot succeed in keeping pollination going, it is just we can start with the countdown, unless we find another way to make food, which seems rather challenging. So the question here, so it's accelerating and fundamental change. I hope you can see the fundamentality. And of course, you can see the exponential pattern for it. I mean, one other one. I mean, 1850. This one is actually calibrated. This, this line here that I put there, I put at 1 billion for people. Because it was in 1840 that for the first time, the total population on the planet was 1 billion. Now, just imagine, it took us 200,000 years so to put it simply, that is 2,000 centuries. You agree? 200,000 years is 2,000 centuries. So in 2,000 centuries, we managed to come 1 billion in 1840. We actually entered the 20th century with 1.3 billion people, and we left the 20th century with 6.3 billion people. So in one century, we added five times more population as in the 10,000 centuries before that. So we've actually added 10,000 centuries worth of population in one century. Well, you don't have to be Einstein to see that that will have consequences. And the question is, are we approaching a tipping point? And these are just a few lines. This is from WBCSD reports. I can show you loads and loads of other trend lines that all look like this. Now, just imagine that you are the pilot of a spaceship. And this is your instrument panel. What would you say? You would say, Houston, we've got a problem. And boy, we do. I mean, this is, for example, well, the print is a bit small, but this actually appeared in, um, in, in, in Nature in 2009, and it actually appeared in 2011 in The Economist. Basically, the green circle in the middle is the safe area for all those segments. So climate change, ocean acidification, stratospheric ozone depletion, uh, chemical pollution, atmosphere, aerosol, etc., etc. So if we're in the green, we're OK. But you can see with three of them, we're already outside the green. And that's climate change, rate of biodiversity loss, and nitrogen cycle. Then there's a number where we are approaching the limit. Some we have clearly not exceeded it. And for two, we actually don't know what the limit is, how far we can go. 
But it's very, very clear, you know, we are in big, big trouble. So, elements for a perfect storm. We have economic crisis from 2008 is still not over. You all know about the social inequity. I mean, Mr. Piketty has been going around in Europe and elsewhere, you know, about the social tensions. Now, those two we can see. You can perhaps even feel it yourself in your wallet, or you can see it about your family or your nature. Social tensions we can see. What we cannot see with our own eyes, unless you have very special kind of jobs, is the ecological stresses that are happening. And so there's a clear need to re-engineer the future. And here is where you come in. Because these things are typically things that you are good at. So we have to go from solving one issue at a time to adopting an interdisciplinary approach with more systemic thinking, more circular thinking, more cross-sector cooperation, get, let go, take, make and dispose model, and go to taking nature into account, go from short-term maximization to long-term optimization, and clearly go away from only shareholder value to stakeholder value, which includes the shareholder, but not exclusively. And just, this is from a very nice, you can Google it, carbon visuals. This actually, because well, you can talk about it, it's also theoretical and numbers, and if you're not really into it, you know, it's difficult to imagine what it looks like. This, well, you of course know where we are. The film that I started with was about here. This is Manhattan here. Uh, with the skyscrapers, the Hudson River, and this mountain, which is projected onto New York, is basically the amount of CO2 the world emits in a single day. Now, America is a big country, you just saw the flight, you know, so you need many days to cover all of America, but I think that was two years, you cover all of America. Because remember, this mountain is many, many times bigger than the highest skyscrapers. And this is only one dimension. And, um, what is interesting, I mean, since you are numerical people uh, and you can do variations on this, you know, for natural resources, but uh, Michael Porter, I don't know whether he's ever been here already, he's going around now doing very much similar talks, although you and I know him, of course, around from his five box competitive positioning uh, thing. So he's now uh, an old management guru and he's now going around doing similar talks. But for example, since you are a very numeric audience, I wanted to share this with you. CO2 emissions is basically a formula driven by four components. One is the number of people, because more people, more emissions. Is the wealth of people, because wealthy people emit more than poor people, times the energy intensity of your economy. For example, in uh, certain countries that is very high. In England, it's particularly low because they've got a big financial industry. Now, the service industry, of course, is not as energy intensive as a making industry. You can also look at, for example, who's got old industry, who therefore needs more resource input for the same amount of output. And the last one is the CO2 intensity of the energy you use. If you use fossil, then of course that's high. If you use coal, it's even higher. If you use gas, that is a little bit less, but you still have it. If you use solar or wind, then it's much less already. Now, the bad news, and by the way, for you, right, the ones in the area, you can actually cross, so you cross out people against person, GDP against unit GDP, energy out of unit, and your CO2 is CO2. So mathematically, this is right. But now, I hope that I explained what these fractions actually mean, because the bad thing is that the first two, for the next couple of decades, will still be rising. There still will be more people on this planet, and we will still get more wealth whether it will be people generated or artificial intelligence or robots generated, but there will be more GDP, and it will be associated with probably more pollution. So that means that basically if we want to bring it down, we are really uh, dependent on these two. It has to be the energy efficiency and the CO2 intensity of the energy we use. I will stop there on, on, on that part because this is an energy seminar, but I would like to introduce to you a concept that for you as MBAs is important, you probably never heard of the exponentiality tax. I was in Ireland, uh, Ramon, uh, three weeks ago, and at, in Ireland at this moment in time, the big issue is water and the water bills because people do not have water meters, and so they would say, well, the rateable value of a house, that determines how much you have to pay for the water, even though you're only there on the weekends or you travel a lot, you know, so it's a big row there. And uh, then I said, well, you know, as a guest, I will not sort of wade into the local politics in Ireland to talk about that. Let me only share with you one thing, that I have a Dutch passport, and so I don't know whether you, but you live in the Netherlands, you told me, well, we pay a tax which nobody else in the world pays, and that's the waterschap, which and translate in English as the water level tax. Now, the Netherlands is for two, so it's called the Nether, Netherlands, uh, Pais Basos, you call it in Portuguese. So it's low-lying, 
So if your living room is at four meters below sea level, you are quite happy to pay whoever is keeping that water at bay. So that's a tax that you may not have heard of, but actually exists, we have it in Holland. What you may not have heard of is the exponentiality tax. Now, it doesn't exist in the formal sense, but it does exist in reality. Because of what it means, I call it the efficiency paradox. Today, there are 900 million cars in the world. In 2050, according to forecasts, there may be 2 billion cars in the world, so twice as much. Now, thanks to the car manufacturers and energy efficiency improvement, it may well be possible that those 2 billion cars will emit less CO2 than those 900 million cars, because also electrification, fuel efficiency, you know, downsizing the uh, cubic inches of the, of the cylinder, and yet getting out turbo technology injection, get more out power, so you get better efficiency. But a 50% improvement, which is pretty good, we all agree with that, I mean, yes, 50% improvement is pretty good. A 50% improvement is no improvement at all. Because if I got 100 cars that use 10, then I half the use per car, but I've got twice as many cars, I still need 10 for the mobility of the world. And so what I mean to say by exponentiality tax is that actually the beginning of all innovation will be absorbed by the still growing population and economic development, which actually puts the bar even higher for us, because if you want to have a real net decrease, you have to work very, very hard because the first fruits of your work will be absorbed by that growth. And that is a very important concept to keep in your mind. Now, don't think that I'm just talking about the future that still has to happen. The future has happened already, although it is not what it used to be, as Ramon said. I mean, the world's largest taxi company owns no taxis. The largest accommodation provider owns no real estate. The largest phone company does not own any telephone infrastructure. The world's most valuable retailer has no inventory. The most popular media owner creates no content. The fastest growing banks have no actual money. The world's largest movie house owns no cinemas. And the largest software vendors don't write the apps. Now, I always accuse the British of having named common sense common sense, because common sense actually is not that common at all. As you can see from this little picture here, people are very busy with pulling this chart with square wheels, and no, 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 we're busy, no thanks. You probably know, you may have heard the name Jeremy Rifkin, he's going around a lot as well, and he's introduced a new concept, and I just, since you probably do know about it, wanted to mention that, he goes around by saying, well, in the end, all business will go to zero marginal cost. Now, for some business models, that may be the case. If it is really purely electronic, if I have an app and I sell 100 more of those apps, you know, there's no, not much extra natural resource used for it, probably a little bit of electricity, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of things still will need to be materialized, whether it's through a 3D printer on, or real life, I need to materialize it. But there are some interesting ways to dematerialize things. And I'm not talking about, well, you're probably too young to have seen the Thunderbirds, you know, but Thunderbirds, yeah, or, or was it another, beam me up, Scott, you know, it was not Thunderbirds, it was um, Space Trek or whatever, Star Trek, in fact. So beam me up, Scott. I'm not talking about that dematerialization, but dematerialization is very possible. For example, those of you that know what cabotage is, that was a law in Europe that said that if a truck in the Netherlands had to bring something to Porto, it could actually drive all the way here, but if something from Porto had to go back to the Netherlands, that truck could not carry it. So that truck had to go back empty. The stuff, let's say the bottles of port wine, that needed to go to the Netherlands were loaded on a Portuguese truck that would actually drive all the way to the Netherlands, and it would not be allowed to take cargo back home, so it would drive back empty. Now, the reason for this was probably unions protecting the jobs of truck drivers, etc., etc., Thanks to green lobbyists in Brussels, this has come to an end. So the cabotage law does not exist anymore now. So both whatever port equipment can come from the Netherlands and the port one can go back to the Netherlands with only one truck, two trips. So we dematerialized, in a way, the other two tri truck trips, possibly also the driver. But that is another challenge that we'll not talk about tonight, but that's another uh, exponential dimension, what will happen with work and jobs in the future. I just want to spend a few more minutes on, uh, I will end in, let's say, five, because we'll leave some, uh, some Q&A as well. Uh, and by the way, I'm happy to leave the slide, so 
Some of them, I hope, are self-explanatory, but I do want to speak a little bit about the crisis of trust that I mentioned earlier. Um, I was a speaker at the COP21 conference in Paris. I know exactly the day that I was invited to speak there. It was the 8th of December. And the reason why I understand that is that on the 8th of December, they introduced the Paris increased ambition. Now, what you can see on this graph are the blue lines. So uh, we are now in 2015 here. Those are like the uh, indicators that we agreed that we would do and that would actually give a certain pathway in the future of CO2 emissions and like different scenarios. So you got the reference uh, no policy, reference low, then you had the continued ambitions. If you continue what we do, we'll get there. And then the Paris increased ambition. Now that is quite enormous, less. And what you can see on this side, so that is the CO2 emission pathways. Here you can see the temperature probability. So these are all like distribution curves and the colors indicate the likelihood that we will contain climate warming to two degrees. Now what happened on the 8th of December, the conference had started with the ambition we are going to contain, to limit global warming to two degrees. And on the 8th of December, so, no, 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 that's not good. We are going to be much more ambitious. We are going to contain it to well below two degrees, i.e. 1.5. Now having worked in this business for a long, long time, I know how incredibly difficult the ambition to reduce it to two degrees is and how infinitely more difficult it is to try to limit it to 1.5 degrees so i asked the question well maybe you know i'm old-fashioned or i don't know or maybe i miss some new technology what are you going to do different for the new objective and he said what, what do you mean I said, well you just formulated a new objective the paris increased ambition what different actions will you take because we're going further away now Oh, no, nothing. It's just our ambition has changed. <laughs> this is what they really said. And to be frank, so let's be where they are. So the color band here goes from pink to gray. is from 2 to 3 till 1.5 to 2. So you need to look, look at the gray band. We actually have between 5% and 30% chance to achieve that 1.5 degrees with the current non-binding agreement and you all know what non-binding means don't you now i don't discount the value of 196 195 countries plus the european commission signing a treaty but if it is non-binding i mean if you would like me to, to sign after the session that i come and install a new kitchen at your house provided it's non-binding i'll sign it you know but you won't see me next week of course but uh well that's i mean i'm exaggerating a little bit but these kind of things and this is not known by the population at large but it will of course come out in the scientific community this is going around already well what were those guys doing uh, there's a little joke or joke not really um but you mbas like two by two matrices don't you we use the blood of mckinsey so here we have like being right yes or no or seem to be right yes or no so we all agree that uh, if you are right um and you are seen to be right then that is okay uh, so we got the yes, yes, so yes, you are right, yes, you seem to be right, or no, you're wrong, and you know, you are wrong, that's all right. So the problem is in the two other matrices. So the first one that is interesting to look at is the one where you seem to be right, but actually you're wrong. What happens there is you betray society. Do we know examples of that? Does anyone drive a Volkswagen? Does everyone do banking with Enron? Does anyone have a Mitsubishi? So, I mean, this happens all the time. So we are betraying society. And I'm citing these business examples because most of you probably will go into business. And to be ethically correct is more important now than ever. What will happen in this world of transparency, you will not hide. You will simply not hide. If you try to betray society in any way or the other, it may not come out immediately, but before the end of your expiry, it will have come out and it will have huge consequences. Now, there's also the other box, and that is where you've got very good ideas, innovations, technologies, but it's misunderstood. So you actually are right, but you seem to be wrong. Now, I have got some personal experience in that, but I won't elaborate on that one. But what happens here is you need to better explain, you need to better communicate. Because we got a crisis of both trust and communication, and that in a time of great uncertainty. And I don't know, uh, what's, uh, is Donald Duck, you mean, you have to help, is Donald Duck in Portuguese also Donald Duck? You call him Donald Duck? 
What's the name of the three nephews of Donald Duck? In Dutch, it's quick, quack, and quack. What are they called in Portuguese? Okay, well, I can't even repeat that. But for my story, there are like three nephews as well, and they are called Nimby, Numbi, and Nimto. Now, you actually may Numbi. You may know Nimby. Nimby is the most famous one of the three little cousins of Donald Duck who try to frustrate, frustrate progress, you know. Politicians have got a bright idea, or business has got a bright idea, then Nimby comes up, and Nimby stands for not in my backyard. <laughs> Numbi is the second brother, not under my backyard, for example, for shale, gas, or CO2 storage. That's for the citizens of this world. And Nimto is for our friends in Lisbon, and in Madrid, and in The Hague, and in London, and in Paris, and Berlin, the politicians. And they say, what a brilliant idea, but not in my term of office. So Nimbi, Numbi, and Nimto basically kill a lot of progress. And that is a communication channel as well. Let me end with this one, perhaps, uh, and I'll show you a little film, and then we got perhaps some, some time for Q&A. I made this one specifically for you because I'm here on the business school. This is about a hair care program for MBAs. Now, actually, Ramon, you're not doing too bad, you know. I think you're doing about 50-50. In the audience, at least, about 50-50 MBAs, uh, men, women, uh, I see some people, they actually say that on brains, hair does not grow, so that's uh, very good, you know, there's a few others there. Uh, well, of course, the dean uh, gives the example, the gentleman over there as well. But even for them, I got some hair care advice. The hair care is, of course, not this hair. Um, the first one, hair, stands for H, A, I, and R, and that is that we actually, the jobs that you will do have some requirements, job requirements. And complex jobs in this time, they require helicopter view, an overview of things. Obviously, they need power of analysis, and I suppose that if you leave this institute, you'll have plenty of that. I hope that you also have imagination. Imagination is everywhere, also outside business schools, but it is very important because you will need imagination to face these big problems. And a sense of reality, and not to be this exponentiality reality, because that is the reality in which you live. Big, good companies that recruit people either explicitly or implicitly use the care criteria. And what they stand for is, how big is your brain? How much is in it? Can you think laterally? Can you think deeply? Can you think systemically? But if you have all that, and your working day looks typically like getting out of bed at 11 and taking your siesta at 2 and then going home at 4, well, you won't do very much, right? So the A stands for achievement drive or energy. How much energy do you have to actually apply that big capacity that you have onto the topic? But if you do that in such a way that you ruffle everyone's feathers, that you upset everyone because you're too much up in their face, well, ask the people from Sony who have to implement strategies, which is far more difficult than developing the strategies, persuading people is very important. Actually, my boss at McKinsey had a little sign in the window bay, and it said, diplomacy is the art to say, go to hell, to someone in such a way they actually look forward to the journey. So that is an important art, you know, to persuade people to come along with you. And so that is the relational skills. And the last one, because just imagine, I've got somebody with a big brain, very intelligent, a lot of energy, and a very smooth talker but this person has the wrong ethical compass, then we are in deep, deep trouble. There are plenty of people that don't have the right ethical compass, but if they are either lazy, or you, know, you don't even want to talk to them, or they dumbos, they cannot be dangerous. But if they have the first three, and the last one is wrong, we are in big trouble. And this actually is where people, the people in the street revolt, they have an antenna in their stomachs. For both politicians, and business leaders. Are you up to the job? Are you telling me the right story? And if you don't, I will send you home. Um, I think we talked about leadership enough uh, to, um, to cover that. So let me go to the last film that I want to show you. And then we're closed. And that is, let me see that, no, the middle one, this one. Yeah. And this is actually perspective from somebody who we've been talking about, Mother Nature herself. Oh, in the middle, oops, sorry about that. Chuck. Yeah, that's it. And where in the middle? Ah, oh, sorry, thank you very much for that. Yeah. See, not there? Oh, that one, yeah. Thank you. Everyone needs a coach. 
mouth up? No? Short crowd. Ah, thank you so much. Some call me nature. Others call me Mother Nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. Sorry, I'm doing something wrong with the... Uh, maybe I, have to, I was trying to put it a bit louder. Uh, no. Okay, then I have to stop it. Do we... Uh, yeah, if you... So how do I get that one to the right? So first stop it there, yeah? Let's go back. Yeah, let's go back. And how do we so do the sound louder? Yeah. Can, can somebody... Yeah? yeah? Is that all? depends on me. Because the first, first right. one was louder. When okay, I thrive, one. you thrive. When I falter, you falter, or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? Seems to be my. I need IT help again. Otherwise, we'll just stop it here. The sound. But is it your finger? Okay, my good. finger is very subtle. Yes, yes. Uh, apparently, very subtle. Yeah. Well, that's that's definitely somebody that we need as well. Is finger spitzing gefühl, and you have yeah, that. Exactly. Um, so, basically, you know, the question is, you know, are we ready to evolve? And uh, I presume that many of you will have heard of Edward Deming. I mean, I lived in Japan, and Edward Deming is like a demigod in Japan. He is the person who actually, when was it, in the 50s or early 60s, uh, the quality control. And so he went to the three big car industries in Detroit, you know, uh, if you still know them, General Motors, Chrysler, and uh, AMC. Um, and they said, no, no, we know how to do this, so thank you very much indeed. So he went to Japan, and there he became an iconic person. And well, I mean, Toyota and Lexus have already been ranking the JD Power's quality index, reliability index in the United States for as long as I can remember. And so if a company gets a Deming Award, they are so proud of it, they actually chisel it in the marble of the entrance hall or at the entrance gate of the company when you arrive there. And so Deming has had many, many debates with CEOs, both in Europe and Japan, uh, in America, but primarily in Japan. And so sometimes he got the question, you know, and that's the question that I put to you as well. So nature is beginning to send invoices, you know, be it in the form of storms, or money we need to spend on, on water levies or what have you, or what I felt was the most impressive in, um, in Paris was actually the stalls of these small island nations where I have to admit to my guilt that I'd never even heard of them. And I saw how they live and you know how they make boats and I thought, well, they have clearly a lower carbon footprint on the world than I have. And yet, due to my behavior, they are number one in the row to be knocked off. So that is happening. It is happening in the poorest regions first, but I can assure you it will come to us as well because we're basically standing on their shoulders. So the question that the CEO asked to Mr. Deming after he'd been there for an analysis, so do we have to change? And so my question to you is, so 
do we have to change? I see a lot of people nodding yes. Can I repeat the question? So do we have to change? Do we have to change? No. No, 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 no. We do not have to change because survival is not mandatory. It's nowhere written that we have to outcompete the dinosaurs. It's nowhere written. By the way, I recommend it, of course, but it's not mandatory and therefore we do not have to, but I recommend we do it. So indeed, you know, for future-proof leadership, here being at a business school, to Porter Business School, I say, enlighten you leaders. Strategy is the pathway between where you are and where you want to go to. Help them to truly understand where we are. Help them to develop an innovative and desirable future as the ultimate goal. Help them develop strategies with sustainability and societal equity as the ultimate profit. Help them to see that economic profit is only an instrument to achieve that. And I would say we only have one home. This is the one that we have. What difference are you going to make? Whatever difference you will try to make, I wish you good luck. Thank you very much. Now, we did promise, I mean, if there are, I mean, uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer a couple of them. If you've got time, I do understand that you may have to go for dinner or for drinks or whatever. But if there are questions, either here or, I don't know, yeah. Can we, can we move around with the microphones, perhaps? Hi. Um, from your, your presentation, which was fantastic, I, I got a positive premise that um, for our survival on this planet, our rates of, of innovation needs to be greater than that of the, of the rate of, of growth of population and the ne negative impacts of that. My question to you is, what are your thoughts on the other school of thought where, as, as, as um, highlighted by people like Stephen Hawking, that says our only chance of survival is for our innovation to take us off this planet to colonize others? I'm not sure whether was, I, I've heard that as well. I actually even know a Nobel Prize winner who's the father of a good friend of mine, uh, Gerhard Hoft, who even wrote a book, uh, Playing Snooker with the Planets. Uh, and he's actually a sponsor of that group, actually in the Netherlands. Uh, there, I do not understand. There are many, many Dutch people who have signed up for the first trial flights. And they are clearly one-way trips. There is no way back. Because they can't take the energy to lift off any vehicle from Mars, because it does not have the optimal gravity, so it's bigger gravity, so to lift and come back. I would simply put to this. I mean, those theories, I of course heard them. I can tell you it is infinitely, infinitely more difficult to make an other planet where major, major conditions for life are not there to make it suitable for living than actually trying to keep things here okay. I mean, basically, we are now at a very special moment in time. I don't know whether you know what the geoengineering is. Geoengineering is the, the science to actually engineer the conditions of life on this planet. There are people like Paul Crutzen, who was a Nobel Prize winner, said, look, climate, climate warm, it's not a problem. We'll just send rockets in outer space, and we just bring a very thin veil of sulfur dioxide molecules, dust, around us, and it will deflect the sun coming in. So he's addressing, we are producing global warming because of CO2 release, so we basically have a duvet, you know, a duvet of sleep, make it warmer, so we got global warming. Said so we can address that by making sure that less warmth is coming in. So then we need the duvet. So we are... We're not doing it yet, but we're thinking about it. So what that means is that the Earth has had many different modus of operandi. For the last, what I said, 70 million years, you know, we had the Holocene, which is quite ideal for our topic. If nature by itself would have decided, I'm going to change it, we would have had the ability to actually push it back into what is optimal for us. That is what we are thinking about now. Now, the irony is, the irony is, that we are actually triggering nature to leave this optimal range for us. So this is really totally absurd. So at the moment in time that we have the capacity to say, just in case nature would change the conditions, we're going to make them keep the same. We have actually triggered nature to move it out. So my hope to answer your question is far more that we develop the geoengineering to actually make good on what we did wrong, 
because this actually is Goldilocks. I don't know whether you know what Goldilocks is, like the three bears, you know, this is exactly the right one. I mean, we have done those studies, you know, on Venus, on Mars, you know, it's either too hot or the wrong gravity, or you don't have the atmosphere. And yes, what they're going to do now, they're going to build these kind of like, what they also have in Devon, these, these geospheres, to live in there. But you can't live outside. I mean, this is a very dangerous dream to suss people, ah, oh, well, it's no problem, you know, we can ruin this planet, you know, there are spare planets. There are no spare planets. We are not going to move 9 billion people to other planets. That is not going to happen. Now, I think so. It was, so this has been said. I don't think it was said by Stephen Hawkins. What Stephen Hawkins did say is he said, artificial intelligence is either the greatest thing or the worst thing that will happen to human mankind. So we better uh, think about it, how we use that. And I think you know it is far easier to actually make sure we can keep things optimal here rather than moving the whole lot. That, that is of a, of a uh, degree of complexity that I do not see possible, at least not for the total population. So if you would select you know, a few people, go, yeah, that will probably happen as an experiment, but not for the population as a whole. And I think you know, uh, there should be enough vested interest to not do that. But those vested interests are primarily here. Because if you Google, for example, global footprint, then you can see that the planet now, or humanity, uh, consumes about 1.2 times the annual harvest uh, of Earth resources. And it's a little bit like you have an income of 100,000 and you spend 120,000. Well, if you got a piggy bank with another 100,000, you can do that for five years. You can top up your actual spending deficit relative to your salary from your piggy bank, you know, if you got savings. And the savings are gone, you can't have that spending level anymore. And that's the same way that we have with our planet. We cannot consume more than what the Earth produces in one year. Well, okay, we've got the fossil resources, so we keep topping it up, but they're finite. You know, it's very simple. Infinity, and that, of course, is the essence of exponentiality, that it goes to infinity. Infinity on a finite planet cannot exist. So we have to make sure that, we, and for example, I'm a big believer in both circular economy and the bioeconomy, that you can, out of the bioproducts, we can basically make all the things that we need. And they, I was at the Hanover Messe, two weeks ago, and it's incredible what can be made out of plants already. It's just stunning. I mean, it requires chemical knowledge. I mean, the biggest news for me last week was that I heard from scientists that they found an alcohol where you add three carbon molecules and a nitrate group, and you give that to a cow, and for the same milk or meat production, it emits half the amount of methane. That is really good news if we can make that work. But it's a deep, deep insight into chemistry. So I think there are possibilities you know, to get this, all the conditions are right. It's just a few things that we got in the wrong direction and then say, well, we'll camp up, we'll go somewhere else. There is no somewhere else, I think. I hope so, it's at least my answer. I thought you were giving it to someone else. <laughs> so I have um, a question related to the, basically the word that you have on all your slides on the top there, which is talent. And um, you implied in your presentation, you said it in your presentation, that linear thinking uh, will probably lead us nowhere, and linear CEOs will have a very difficult job in the future. And the opposite of that being, I believe, you, it was in one of your slides, circular uh, thinking or um, nonlinear. Uh, thinking. But in practice, um, and because we're, we're in a business school, in practice, um, how should schools evolve and which uh, types of, um, of um, different processes and behaviors and, and teaching methods should be applied in business schools or in any, any other schools, from kindergarten probably um, up until business schools? Uh, what should schools do differently? Uh, what types of skills should they uh, train? And also, um, more from a corporate side, um, what types of profiles should we be looking for in the market or different mixes of profiles if we want to succeed in, yeah. in the future? Yeah. Well, that's, of course, a brilliant question. Thank you very much. For this. this is not a setup, but I'm very happy with the, the question anyway. So it is not this kind of circular economy that we want to go for, uh, you know, the current single cycle circular economy. Uh, but it's this one here. I mean, basically, education now focuses on the red circle. So it's all traditional subjects, you know, uh, like math, history, languages, et cetera, et cetera, which now gets expanded with some coding, robotics, and entrepreneurship, which are good expansions. 
but we also need the green and the yellow circle. And the green circle, so the, the red one is, is knowledge is what you know. The other one has got to do much more with skills and competences, working together, you know, creativity, critical thinking, communicating, collaboration, working with others, working with people from different backgrounds. Now, that's the good thing about a business school because I remember at least at Nainor and ASAP, I presume it's no different here, uh, Ramon, uh, that you work in groups on, on a case, right? Now, I do not know about the international mix. I didn't ask you for your nationalities, uh, but I presume that you got a, perhaps an international mix here as well. That is a great contribution. In principle, what is important is not so much the international variation, it is actually the diversity of thought that is important. And by the way, if you go for boards, what you really want is diversity of thought. And if you can achieve that by having different genders or different religions, that's fine. But if, for example, you would promote into your boards women that have started to become think completely like men, well, you may have a female body at a table, but if she thinks like a man, you have no diversity of thought. And that is really what you want. And actually, the analogy there is immunology in, in medication. Basically, to get an inoculation, what happens, you actually inject a small controlled amount of the bad stuff into you so that the body's go, oh, this is really bad, and then is ready for the next time when it comes a real attack. So boards, what they should have, they should have the outside world living in. And on your question, I would suggest that's also the case for schools. Schools should have the outside reality living in. So I will send it actually to Ramon, uh, because he lives in, in the Netherlands and perhaps reads some Dutch, but although this report is in English as well, by the National Denk Tank. And they came up with, for example, even in the Netherlands, we've got black and white schools. So in privileged areas and underprivileged areas. And they actually said they should do extracurricular activities. Um, it's called the Make and Meet Challenge, whereby people from the same intellectual level, but from different socioeconomic background, actually do some project work together. Because it turns out that the other knows also jokes. Okay, I always go to further away to vacation, and my father has a bigger car than yours, etc., etc. But it becomes uh, appreciation. Because actually, like Franklin Roosevelt said, there is nothing we should fear more than fear itself. If you live in silos, you and I, who are perhaps in the same silo, because, you know, those Muslims, those really evil people, I mean, have to get them out, you know? I mean, that is exactly what the Alternative für Deutschland in Germany is doing now. It started as an anti Europe party, it's now an anti Islam party. Well, you know what happened 70 years ago, just change the word Muslim for Jew and you got another scenario. So I think schools should have that reality that is outside there in the school. The second idea that they had to have people at, well, you may not know a gymnasium, so the, 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 the baccalaureate, so what you do before going to university and then people who work with their hands. Let them also do project work together. Now clearly one will go to university and the other will not, but the other one, but that hinge was only being installed thanks to me. So there is mutual appreciation again, and that mutual appreciation actually solidifies the social fabric. Because that really we need to get right, because if you got lines and no knots, you can ask, you've got many fishermen here in Portugal, ask how many fish he could catch with a net that has no knots. Not many. So I think that is very important for a school to do. And so the third one is a little bit what I talked about today. It's like, how do you engage with the world? The world boasts as a world community, but the world also uh, as a planet. And well, mindfulness is now a completely new concept, uh, but it's curiosity, uh, courage, resilience, ethics, and leadership. I think you know this should be taught even at primary and secondary schools. And the reason why, with all due respect for any business school, the most strategic forms of education are primary schools and secondary schools, because in addition to knowledge content, we also give them citizenship training. And if our society will crumble, it will be because we've got cracks in the citizenship. I'm not talking about the MBAs who've got nice cost of the jobs, like I've had as well, you know. I mean, that's not that. It is because the big bulk of society is simply cracking up. And so we all have an interest in doing that. And where do you do it? In schools. Thank you very much for this inspiring talk. Uh, one of the statements that you made is, future is not given, but it is not random either. But then there are these theories like Nicholas Taleb's uh, black swan theory, which states that it's the completely random events that creates the most difference. Now, I don't know, this seems sort of conflicting to me or... No, uh, Nicholas, <laughs> Nikola Tesla was one of the most brilliant people, probably being put down by Alva Edison because they were contemporaries. Probably uh, Tesla was the greater scientist and, and, uh, and technologist. Now, I mean, of course, I mean, we've had it already. I mean, 
Who would have thought that I have now in my pocket more computing power than Houston Control had when they put the first man on the moon? And every one of you has that. Huh? I'm just talking about my smartphone. Uh, look about the internet. It was unimaginable, you know, only like 20, 25 years ago, you know, to have it at this scale. So that slide that I showed you with all the disruption is happening, you know, this will be big. But for example, what will not change is that we, we need drink and food, we need space, we need clothing for mobility. We will not dematerialize and then rematerialize. We will physically go where we can substitute that by not making flights but doing video conferencing, or we can actually say we, we communicate in different ways. But unless you would get a complete dematerialization of the world and society, by the way, there are also people talking about that. Huh? For example, somebody like uh, Bettino Mazzaro, you can Google him as well. He thinks that's where we're going. He talks about the ascension of human mankind. That we are only here for a ride, like a Disney ride. Well, that is beyond my knowledge and capabilities, but I'm aware of those kind of theories. So I think Taleb's, which by the way, those of you that have not read the book Taleb, The Black Swan, I can absolutely recommend it, because that is often the trigger of disruption. But it never disrupts everything as a whole, although there is one dimension that I did not mention that I would like to mention, uh, thanks to your question. We've seen the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Now, that was pretty significant for those people that lived in Europe. But it didn't do anything with the world, because at the same time we had a Chinese Empire or a Maya Empire. Because of globalization also taking societal dimensions, and particularly the ecological dimension is, of course, the one big equalizer. I mean, I'm a Dutchman, and I have to explain often abroad what a polder is. A polder is basically a basin of people between dikes that share a certain same water level. And there may be another group at a higher water level, there may be another lower level, but you share the same water level. And you sit around the table, and if any one of us breaks the dike, all of us get wet feet. If one of us has got a great idea as a pump, all of us get dry feet. So that's like the mutual fate that we have between within the polder. Now, actually, that model now applies because of the global dimensions of ecological change applies to the world. So if there will be a rise or fall of any one empire, it will be the total empire. Of course, in gradual, I mean, the Maldives and the Marshall Islands will disappear first. Switzerland, where I live now, well, that will probably pretty late to the list, you know. Um, but so there is a kind of a ranking, but it will affect everyone because global warming is not called global warming for nothing. So in a summary, I think um, black swan events can be very big triggers for disruption. If you would get an accumulation of several big disruptions at the same time, it would give a mega disruption. And it can either lead to apocalyptic endings or it can lead to ascension endings, but now I'm talking about things that I really do not know. So, But I would say, on the whole, um, it can trigger disruptions in a industry or in industries, but never at the whole front at the same time in the way that global warming and climate change does do. So <laughs> if I was touched by this presentation. So some years ago, I heard someone saying that um, even if we can, which is impossible to stop the, the pollution, uh, that would not be the way that would be done. We should mitigate, not to stop it. Uh, but after some, uh, some years later, I heard another person uh, complimenting, saying that um, actually we we should consider climate change as a necessary evil. So my question for you is, what do you think about these statements? You believe in them? You back it up these statements? Or you think really that we should invert this, this consumerism and consumism in the world that actually contributes exponentially for pollution and for our uh, extinction, actually, I think? Yeah, not for the planet. Eh? The planet is not in danger. It's just that if the framework conditions that prevail on the planet happen to be no longer optimal first, we go and some other species comes, you know? I mean, I think a crucial question is we all, everyone in this room, accepts that our personal life is finite. 
we just have great, great difficulty in thinking that our species might be finite. But we've only been here for the last three seconds of 24 hours. So what makes us so bold to think that we will be here forever? So that is like a broad statement. I actually am a firm believer in mitigation, and mitigation to me uh, as opposed to adaptation. So I think it's both. It's not either or. Uh, I think we should adapt as well. I, For example, I think um, uh, in energy we can do huge things. And why is it that cars, I mean, do you know that the Volks, we're now renting a Volkswagen Golf to drive around a bit in Portugal. You know that that Golf has the same fuel consumption as the Beetle 40 years ago? So where's the progress? Well, there has been progress because the Golf that we're driving is twice as heavy. So the engine actually does that with the same amount of fuel. So that's pretty good. This is this 50% improvement I was talking about. But no actual improvement. Now, could we drive that back? Well, some of additional weight is due to safety legislation. But a hell of a lot is due to luxury, electric seats, what have you, you know. Is that really all necessary? Can we not make that later? So I think downsizing later, uh, light weighting is very important. I think one of the innovation challenges and opportunities, eh, because it's a challenge as well as an opportunity, is uh, uh, to see, actually these are not my words, these are from Prince Charles who said to me once, Hans, we actually need some marketing gurus who can, making, who can make using less cool. <laughs> So to make it cool, you know. Uh, so I mean, there is these. How do you call them? The, you call them the um, not the fixers, the Netflixers, the, the Nixters. People who are actually proud not to buy new things or to use things very, very long. There's a there's a there's a name for that as a category. Now that of course is very bad for business. What is it called? Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, that, 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 the hipsters, thank you for that. So that actually already exists. If you Google, for example, resilience communities or transition towns, I mean, I was amazed when I did that for the first time. I actually think that the change will not come from the top. I think the change will come from the bottom. Also for communities of people, well, this cannot go, forget those people in the capital. I mean, they simply don't get it. You know, big companies, you know, they can't be trusted. We're going to do it ourselves. Do you know how many kinds of currencies exist, non-official currencies in the world? It's in the thousands. You've got, for example, Ithaca hours in the state of Ithaca. And I come and wash your car. You give me some Ithaca hours, but you are very good at, you've got this little lawn mower. You come actually mow the lawn at my house and I give you Ithaca hours for that back. And because Ithaca hours can only be used in Ithaca, you automatically stimulate the local businesses. So there are all sorts of dynamics going on. This is only one model of doing that. So I think I believe in innovation. I also believe that, you know, if the pressure of the wall in your back makes you very innovative. I mean, what I've been trying for years is actually build a burning platform in the minds of people to make them jump. Now, if they do, I am actually very merciful to them because they will jump without burning their legs. If they don't jump because I fail, well, they will be on a burning platform, their pants will go on fire, but you'll be surprised how high they can then jump. Now, whether we all will survive in that process, I do not know. I think, you know, it's not an either or. If you talk about energy, we have to look at both the supply side as well as the demand side, and that is actually not only energy, but all forms of resource use. If you talk, is it either adaptation or mitigation? I think it is both, not either or. I mean, I don't know whether you guys know the book Animal Farm by George Orwell, you know, where the pigs, you know, uh, actually uh, evict the farm farmer. That, of course, is an allegory on the Communist Party, and then the, the animals see that the pigs actually have left the pigsty and are now living in the, in the farmhouse, you know, and then rumors have it that the pigs are actually lying in the beds even of the farmers, and then rumors have it that they even dressed in the clothes of the farmer. So then the whores and the goat and they all come out, okay, pigs come out, we want an explanation. And then the lead pig comes out on the balcony, you know, wearing the coat of the farmer, and says, well, of course animals, you're of course right, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. That's the most famous line from that book. Now, actually, you can also say, well, we've got many challenges. You know, worries that we have a leaking roof, uh, the car that's not doing so well. We've got many challenges, but not, well, all, uh, all challenges are equal, but some are more equal than others. I think we would really need a big focus. I mean, I sometimes, at conferences with politicians, I actually openly call them, you are kitchen firefighters on the Titanic. Now, on the Titanic, if you've got a fire in the kitchen, you better extinguish the fire because the ship might sink. But if you are on the Titanic and you extinguish the kitchen fire, but you don't watch the iceberg radar, why do you extinguish the kitchen fire? Save the champagne. Tell the orchestra to come to the main deck and go out with a big bang. Now, that's not what I recommend, obviously, 
but only focusing on kitchen firefighting is not going to do it. So they really should have the greatness of looking what are the really important challenges. And what we need is a kind of a Marshall Plan, a kind of a Marshall Plan dimension for the really big challenges. That is, I think, the only thing that can bring us about. Now, this will happen, and you are young enough, you will live this. But the problem is that the later we find out, the bigger the pot of money in the Marshall Plan would be, and the bigger the sacrifices will be that we each have to do. I mean, I'm here at the business school. You all know what an MPV is, a net present value. You know what the internal discount rate is. We've got a serious problem as humans with the discount rate of events in the future. Big events that we can describe in fairly great detail. Oh, well, it won't be that bad. Or my children will solve it, and things like that. Whereas if you leave it rotting, and your children have to solve it, it will be much, much more difficult to solve that problem as then when we do it now, because it becomes bigger. So we discount in a very strange way the future. Well, no, it's not a question, just uh, to thank you on behalf of the school for this, as I said in the beginning, this is the kind of thing that provokes our thinking hopefully our behaviors as well. And um, I think as a business school, uh, you left something for us to think about. And uh, I'm sure the question is, as, as leaders for the future, um, I think there are two messages here. One is a question of attitude and, and how we reflect on these things. The other thing is more explicitly about problems with the planet. I think there are two messages there. <laughs> one, one about, hey, the world is exponential, it's not linear, so we have to uh, prepare ourselves for the future in a different way. And the other way is, of course, the more uh, urgent uh, need to do something about the environment and, and how we plan it will survive. Oh, yeah. Maybe we won't. That's exactly <laughs> not we as individuals, but yeah. as a species. Yeah. 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 And I think that's an important message for all of us. So with, with those words, again, thanks. And um, thank you all for, for it coming. And I know it's quite late. Probably you want to go and and have dinner or, or go back home or relax, whatever. So we'll do the same. Okay, thank, thank you again. You. Good